Okay. Um, we are here with Eva Sandoval. Um, Bonilla. Bonilla. It is September 26, 2015. Can you restate your name and your birth date and your place of birth, please? Yes. Eva Sandoval Bonilla, January 6, 1949. Uh, I was born on Weisenberger Street in Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you. Um, first question, where did your family live before they came to Fort Worth, whether that was Mexico, whether that was another country, or whether that was South Texas? Okay, well, first of all, my family was here when it was Spain and when it was Mexico. So oh. my grandmothers would tell me that the river crossed them. They used to live uh, on my paternal side. They were the Spaniards. And my grandfather came here because of the railroads. He came from Laredo, but their family came in through Galveston. So they were here generations, and my, even my grandmother was born in 1900. So her grandfather and her great-grandfather fought at the Alamo with Jim Bowie. And he spoke Spanish, she told me. Anyway, but uh, my paternal grandmother married an Indio from New Mexico. So he uh, and his mother was uh, uh, from New Mexico too. They moved here and they had a, a rancho in south, southeast Texas. And when, I mean, and that was inherited from their great grandparents, but it was taken away during the revolution. So my grandfather, was, as a young boy, was raised on horses and caring for uh, cattle. And, uh, and so they were migrant workers from that when they took away their, uh, when he was young. And so he, when he married, him and my grandmother and their children, their seven children, were also migrant workers. And they, they, did, uh, they had to leave school like my mother in the fifth grade to pick whatever, cotton in Texas, they go to Michigan for tomatoes or whatever. Anyway, so they were all over the place, and they, my, father, my grandfather finally uh, came here, my maternal grandfather, because of the packing houses, because he could butcher up the cattle. So we grew up right there on Weisenberger Street next to Target and Montgomery Plaza, and we had livestock there. Goats, cheap. We even had a horse. I didn't know how to ride a horse. I didn't even know a horse needed a saddle. We would just jump on from the porch, grab the mane, and it kept going until it knocked us off. And then we'd get up and do it again. And that's probably why I have arthritis now. But anyway, <laughs> yes, that's where I grew up. And one block of Weisenberg, no, two blocks of Weisenberger was like a barrio. And so the first block where we lived, the 2700 block, it had four generations of our, my, my uh, as a matter of fact, my father met my mother on that street. Their families were both there. And so my mother, didn't want to date my father or have anything to do with him and my father who was because he thought she said he was chocante that he was a show-off and arrogant and he was a Spaniard and she was a, a Mexicana India and I'm the only one in the family that's my generation that came out with the Indian features with the high cheekbones and stuff and all my brothers and sisters were white so I mean very Spaniard and uh, and my father was like that so my mother uh, didn't want the you know to date him and stuff but finally after many times and bringing a priest she went out with him and anyway but that's how they got started because I had four generations my great-grandfather I remember him being uh, in having a wake at my grandmother's house because that's what they did they didn't have a funeral home they had a uh, the casket was in my grandmother's house they'd empty all the sofas and everything and they put the casket there and that was really traumatic for me to see this, but yeah, but that was my great-grandfather, and uh, that was my um, Mami Teresa, who was my maternal grandmother's father. There were Rosas. You know, since we're talking about your family, this wonderful history, truly, and can I have their names just so we can keep Yes, on, uh, and I had great role models. Right beside me on the east side of my house was my maternal grandparents, and that was uh, uh, Luis and Teresa Perez. She was a Rosas, and it was her grandfather who lived with her. And so there was like three generations in that house. And uh, that, because they were the parents of my mother, Elena Perez. 
and uh, and she was like the oldest in the family of seven. My mother was, so they had her miss uh, drop out of school in the fifth grade so she could go and do migrant work. And then across the street was my grand my maternal grandfather's uh, parents, and that was Lucas and Jesusita Perez. And as a matter of fact, their son today. The young, uh, one of their youngest sons is, do, is doing uh, an interview. He's going to be 90 years old, and he's here today interviewing. So y'all might do his interview. Anyway, his yes, and his he they came from that was a family of nine there, that grew up. And then when we my mother and father married, they lived in the uh, duplex that my grandmother, my his mother, my paternal grandmother. Her name was mommy. Well, her name was Francisca Trevino Sandoval and I called her Mami Panchita. And uh, Mami Panchita lost her husband the month I was born in 1949. Uh, I was born January 6th and he died a few weeks afterwards. He, he did get to see me, but he, he worked with the railroad and he had diabetes and they didn't know how to treat diabetes or even know the disease back then. So he lost his legs and he couldn't work for the railroad. And of course they didn't have uh, workers comp or any insurance to provide for them. So my grandmother, uh, had to do everything from her house. She had to wash clothes, uh, she'd make tamales to sell, even though she was my Spanish grandmother, she learned how to make tamales so she could sell them. And she would uh, iron, take care of kids, wash clothes, everything from her little house. But she ruled, and that was from a family of seven also. And uh, uh, she, she was the best cook, oh my gosh. We grew up, uh, I, grew, I grew up at Best Worlds because I, I lived in the middle of my both grandmothers, and when my mother worked at the Hotel Texas as an elevator operator, she, I from three to eleven at night at dinner, I'd either go to my mommy Teresa's house or mommy Panchita's house, and if I didn't like what one of them did, I'd say I already ate, and I'd go to the other house. Anyway, I get away with that. But uh, my mother, as a matter of fact, speaking of her, she was in, and you know they were all strong women. They let their families. And so I always took it for granted that that's what women do. So I take care of all the finances and make the decisions in our household. Cause, uh, and then also, they also instilled in me that family was very important. And I, I, I took that for granted. That I, thought, I thought that was what everybody did. And until later on in life when I went into the workforce and I found out all the dysfunctional families that didn't even speak to each other. Anyway, but... Um, uh, my family uh, lived in a, in, in, and I grew up in the best times, if, if you were the right color. They protected me from discrimination and color because I didn't even know I was poor. And when I heard my, grand, my uncle speak, they say there was poor and there was poor poor. We were probably poor poor. And I didn't even realize it until my uh, daughter, my youngest daughter went to TCU and wrote a paper and told, talked about how poor we were. I said, oh yeah, we were poor. We've always helped everybody else. My family was always very uh, involved in the community. And my father, uh, we grew up in Weisenberger, like I said, with all the livestock, because the streets were like callejones. They didn't have, which are alleys. They didn't have uh, dirt road. I mean, it was all dirt. So if we, not that we had good shoes, but just to, have, to protect our shoes, we'd have, when it rained, we'd have to walk in the mud to get on the bus, and then like, when we got to school, wash off our feet to put our shoes on, you know? And no matter if it was cold or if it was whatever, because the teachers wouldn't let us walk in with muddy shoes. Anyway, uh, um, what else were you gonna ask? I'm sorry. No, can you please tell me any of the community organizations you were in, whether it's political, church, oh yes, but in, also you said your family was involved in, in other yes. organizations. Yes, my father was probably the best role model there was. He wanted to fix these alley streets. He wanted to take care of his community, and he found out that the only way you could do that was through politics, and because uh, going to city hall, so. His neighbors who didn't speak English were losing their homes because they didn't understand. There was a board, uh, board and commissions committee that would, they'd go up to the hearing and they'd tell them they have so many days to fix the house. Well, they didn't understand that. So they'd, they'd tear down their house. They'd lose their house. So my father was upset with that. So he went to go talk to uh, the city about that. And they said, well, I tell you what, Mr. Sandoval, why don't you come and be part of this? So my father talked to his boss and to let him, him off once a month to serve on the Board and Standards Commission. 
and he'd give up his hourly wage to do this. And then he found out that there was uh, uh, more into politics. Er politics was everything. So uh, when he got out of the service, he was a World War II veteran, Jesse Domingo Sandoval. And so he found out that his friends uh, were not being able to get the health care that they needed because they were Mexicanos, even though they, were, they had fought in World War II. And they weren't even allowed to be buried in the white cemeteries, uh, the regular white cemeteries. So he f helped start the um, American GI Forum. And uh, he served on the state board with Dr. Hector Garcia, who started it in Corpus Christi. And my father was the president in Tarrant County. And from that, uh, they did the poll tax drives for $3.50. You had to pay a poll tax. That was a lot of money back then. And then uh, I, he would get me out there and my brother and my sister uh, after church to we had have the the get the poll tax out so we tried to sell the poll tax well it was hard to sell the poll tax uh, even though we were there and we we're telling them how important it was and how we needed to have a voice and the only voice was was getting voting you know and so my brother and uh, and I were out there my my brother he's about four years younger than me, but he was the one that would do the manual labor and, and uh, doing the signs, because it was the old-fashioned way, and, uh, and stuff like that to, to get the people to protect us. That uh, The other thing was, because the American GI Forum was not uh, political, and it was a nonprofit organization, they had to start FOSL. PASO is a political association of Spanish-speaking organizations that started in San Antonio. So my dad was the first president and brought it here to Tarrant County. And that was a nonpartisan group that supported people that, that uh, cared for what we needed, the, our needs of the community, the Mexican-American community. And we would, uh, I remember, I, I was a member, that was the first organization I belonged to uh, because uh, uh, he would, he told me I was a member because he would make me type up the little, uh, we would have a forum and we would endorse uh, the, the candidates and we'd do a little sheet sheet. So we'd make like, uh, gosh, nine little sheet sheets on this uh, on memogram uh, uh, paper. We would, uh, we had a memograph machine. I don't know if you remember those. They were uh, blue, you put ink on it and they, they, they didn't have like the copies like this. We would roll them out and cut them up. So I got to do that. Anyway, so I was really excited in 1966 when I was a senior in high school that the poll tax was abolished and completely because that was the first triumph I ever felt as in my life. I said, oh my God, I had a part of that, you know, and, and it worked. Usually, you know, now in life, when I ever I vote for a candidate, I'm very progressive and, and I vote for the right candidate that uh, uh, they lose. But that was a triumph. But uh, my first encounter, uh, my parents didn't, well, my parents didn't want me to work for money. They wanted me to work for, to volunteer. So at the age of 14, I started volunteering at uh, United Way at a daycare center. And they'd send us, we were poor, but we would ride the bus to whatever to do my volunteer work. And then when I was 16, I was the first Latina candy striper at John Peter Smith Hospital. And I worked there 40 hours a week usually during my uh, sophomore, junior, and senior years. And I thought that was, you know, I learned a lot. I learned about leadership. You cannot ever uh, be replaced by the work that you do uh, in the community and the the wealth of awards or rewards and recognition that you get because when you know you're helping somebody and they succeed and not personally but success is about uh, someone else helping someone else to succeed anyway and uh, now I'm very very involved I have too many things that I'm involved in uh, but back then when I, I was the first student at Tarrant County College South Campus and uh, in 1967, because I graduated from Green B. Trimble High School in 1967 with a business degree. So I could type, I could take dictation and all that. So I was a work study student. Like I said, we were very poor, so I've qualified for work study. They didn't have like the scholarships and stuff, even though Basel had had a fundraiser and they were able to give me a $120 scholarship to go because I really helped them, you know. 
Uh, but Basso did a lot of amazing things. One of the things that they did, and I keep forgetting, uh, my father, they, they got the Republicans to pay for a bus to go help march with Cesar Chavez in Austin. Fort Worth went. They were president. I got to see this. I was 14, so my dad said I couldn't go, but I helped organize it, you know. And then, but later on in life, my husband and I, in, a, in the early 70s, we were able to host Cesar Chavez during one of his uh, fasts and uh, his last fast, as a matter of fact, when he was here in Fort Worth, because we were on the board of Barrios Unidos. I met my husband, my soulmate, in 70, uh, I mean, in uh, 68. He was a year younger, but I was drawn to the people and the causes then because of my, the way I was raised, a social change and social justice. And I met a lot of Vietnam veterans that were uh, disillusioned and angered and confused because they had just came back from a war and saw all the ugliness of war and losing their friends and family. And so we became members of Mayo, Mexican American Youth Organization, and my husband was a brown beret. So we were drawn to each other. It was fate, okay? <laughs> anyway, but we, because of that, we got to go to uh, Crystal City. They had just had that experiment where they got Mayo to, to uh, go and uh, register everybody, this was in 69, uh, to become, uh, to vo register to vote because there anybody from dog catcher to prom queen were all white, yet it was almost 98% Tejanos that lived there. So we did that and we went to the first Chicano Leadership Conference there and, uh, and then we went to the first in 1971 or yeah, 71, we went to the first uh, Raza Unida conference in uh, San Antonio. So I became a state representative for Tarrant County and La Raza Unida party. That is the only party I've ever shown, uh, that I showed that I am a member of. Because I'm now I'm more of independent and, and I vote for the person. Unfortunately, many times I have to vote in the primary with one party because I don't like the way that is. You have to vote either Republican or whatever. But anyway, so, but the best part of me being La Raza, in the La Raza, La Raza Unida is I learned the grassroots organizational skills. And I went to the first uh, Women's Political Caucus State Convention in Mesquite, Texas. And my hero, Gloria Steinem was there. And uh, that was a very monumental uh, um, weekend because I also found out I was pregnant with my first child, uh, my daughter. And Gloria Steinem uh, says this thing about how can you expect your daughters, this great, great quote, she has lots of great quotes, how can you expect your daughters to be brave and to be out there if you don't do it, if I don't take the risk? And um, I did take some risks, but I didn't take enough risks, I don't think. Because the, one, the only thing I regret is I didn't complete my college degree, even though I, was, uh, I had my child and I listened to my in-laws and my parents telling me that, because my husband and I were married at the time, we weren't supposed to have kids, okay, until we graduated, but that didn't happen. Anyway, so w I got pregnant and when my daughter was two years old, my husband got his degree at TCU. He had received a scholarship to go there. And uh, you just got through interviewing uh, Luis Flores, who, Louis, who graduated in his class and they, through the same uh, scholarship at TCU, so that was a coincidence. But in the meantime, um, um, I went, my parents then, and his parents told me that it was up to me to let the man provide for us so I should get a job and take care of the child and uh, let him get his degree so he could take care of us. But now I tell my daughters, and I have three of them, no, you need to get your degree, which they did. They all got their degrees, and I said, you cannot depend on Prince Charming. He's only in the, in the storybooks because it's, I'm a feminist, and a feminist is someone who believes in the rights of others, and my husband's a feminist. Uh, most, uh, he used to be a, a machismo, uh, a brown beret, until he joined Mayo, and he joined Parraso Unida, and I, then he became a feminist. But we were also Chicana, Chicanos. I was a Chicana. Even though I was born with my birth certificate saying I was white and I was labeled Mexican-American, even though my paternal, uh, I mean, my maternal grandparents were Spaniards and Indios, and, and, uh, and now I'm, I'm labeled 
Hispanic, but I, when I was educated, I became a Chicana, and today I'm a Latina. And I tell this to everyone. Uh, we take on different roles as we go through life. Just like uh, yesterday when I gave a speech to the Diversity Summit at Tarrant County College, and my topic was diversity and leadership, I really believe there is no natural born leader. You are molded into it by education, your environment, your background, and failure. Failure is the biggest experience that we could have to make us a better person. Anyway, so now I serve on the board of the Women's Center, uh, Fort Worth Sister Cities International, because I believe in global, uh, everybody being global, and especially students. And uh, I also serve on uh, Hispanic Women's Network of Texas. MANA, I'm on the National Board of MANA. I'm the Vice President, and it's a national Latino organization. And Hispanic Women's Network of Texas is an affiliate of it. Uh, my greatest uh, feat that I think I did was that I started the Latinas in Progress program in, in 2006, and it's still going on strong. And when I was president of Hispanic Women's Network at that time, I uh, replaced my whole board with young professionals, and they're doing an outstanding job. And if you haven't heard about them, then I think y'all need to document the history on Hispanic Women's Network. Anyway. Can you uh, tell me what Latinas in Progress is? Okay, Latinas in Progress, we work with senior high school Latinas, and uh, we put them through five modules. The first module is College 101, and we have their one parent. We used to say their parents. Well, when you have 120 students and you ask for their parents to come, you get their uncles, their aunts, their cousins, and you got over 300 people in this little classroom. So now we say one parent can come with you. So this uh, last two Saturdays ago, we had our first session, and that's at UTA. We take them to a, universe, a different university all for all five modules. College 101 was at, uh, we teach them about FAFSA and, and TASFA, and, and we, we uh, have different panels even for the parents because I went back to school and got my degree when I was 57 years old. I was on that panel with Dr. Robert Munoz, who is the Vice President at Tarrant County College, because we tell them, these, your daughters are gonna inspire you to get more educated, and if you wanna go to school, this are the options for you to go to school. And we also, of course, tell them that they need to encourage their daughters to get to school and to stay and to come to our sessions. The second session, is, the second module is called uh, Writing Skills. And uh, the English professors at Tarrant County College Northwest Campus, they teach them how to do their resume and how to do thank you cards. And because whenever you're applying for anything, it's good to have a good resume and then to thank them. And so, unfortunately, right now the schools are not teaching writing skills and they're failing them, so we had to add that module. The third one, we teach them about civicism and the culture, and that's at University of North Texas. And that's uh, Dr. Valerie Martinez Ebers, who is the, the program director over there, and I put it together. And I tell them my history, because a lot of people don't understand why my children do not speak Spanish. And my daughters are fifth generation, but the language was removed from us. And uh, we weren't allowed to because we were taught to not ask questions and to assimilate. So when I went to school, they would pronounce my name Eva Sandoval, even though my, I knew my name was not Eva Sandoval or Eva Sandoval. I was a young child and I was scared to question them. Anyway, so all my friends knew me as Eva until I went to college and I took on my own identity and that was Eva as I was, t as I was named. Anyway, uh, but the uh, fourth module is uh, assertiveness. We teach our students, and uh, that's taught at Texas Wesleyan University, and we teach them that Doña Dormat doesn't live here anymore. So we teach them to be more assertive because typically the young Latinas, especially the ones that we get, most of them are first generation now, but at least they, they came here for a better opportunity. So they're here and they're ready to go to you know, learn and get a better life. And so we teach them about DACA. We teach them about uh, how to say, uh, be safe and uh, about health and um, how, to, you know, what's, how to find somebody who's, uh, be, well, no, in life skills, the last one is the one that we teach them. Uh, and that's, let's see, which university is that? 
I uh, forgot where we're going to do that because we change sometimes. It's the Texas Women's, and of course we go to University of North Texas. And the way we do this is we, oh, TCU, that's where that one's taught. TCU, I forgot about TCU. As a matter of fact, this is probably the 12th year that, I, that we're receiving a full ride from TCU because uh, our student, and they're usually Excel, 99.8% of our students that I've been working with have graduated from college. And that's, we have raised over a million dollars in scholarships. We'll be having a gala uh, October 30th that's called Y uh, también los muertos bailan. It's to honor Dia de los Muertos, so we all go dressed up in Dia de los Muertos outfits. But anyway, and we'll have our state conference. We have, and we're the largest uh, chapter in Fort Worth right now. We have over 200 members. And we've made a statement, I think. And, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry we can't take more applicants in our Latinas in Progress, but we're, uh, universities can only handle so many, you know, and we even get them to, we have translators like when we have the parents. Fort Worth ISD helps us with that. And then uh, we all you know, have connections and network, but we're all role models. And most of the ones that run these are the young professionals. So the girls look at them and they come back and they pay it forward. Some of them have been um, parts of them, like my daughters. Uh, one of my daughters did do that. And she's uh, involved in, with uh, Hispanic Women's Network. Anyway, but uh, it's a great program, a stellar program. Um, I just had one quick question, just because there are a lot of times radical history isn't really recorded right. in the cities. So I wanted to move more towards a little bit of uh, the Brown Berets in Mayo and Fort Worth. Okay. And how active those groups were in Fort Worth in the 60s and 70s. They really weren't active until like 69 and 70 and the reason we really got organized here in Fort Worth because of the shooting of a young guy in Dallas so and because of the uh, so the Santo Rodriguez Santo, yes that's when we got organized so the Fort Worth Bramberets joined forces with the uh, uh, Dallas uh, Bramberets and it was Medrano who was our leader and he was in Dallas Madrigo, no Medrano Medrano yes and so I was just, uh, I, I supported them because my boyfriend was, at the time, my husband uh, was part of it. But they were very, very active here. And they were nonviolent. And they epitomized um, Cesar Chavez thinking on nonviolent marches. So they were in this area. But then we went to like uh, a mile. Uh, that's where it's, you know, we went and helped them. And most of the ones that were in the Brown Beret were part of Mile. So, so that, and that was for, for real. And uh, um, that's our side. And did you, um, did you or your boyfriend or any? My husband. Your husband or anybody, you know, go to the protest in Dallas? Oh yes, the I was there too. Okay. I, yes, I, I took pictures and we have pictures of that. Unfortunately, a lot of things in our history, we didn't have pictures of. And that's why history isn't recorded that well, because we didn't, we were hippies on top of that. We were flower children. And we didn't believe on those th in those things. When we, we traveled light, you know, we were part of the movement, but we traveled light. We didn't even think about recording history back then. And I regret that. That's another regret, you know. Um, I, from what I know, there was a black and brown solidarity with the Santa Rodriguez case. Do you remember? And uh, today it's being repeated. And do you remember African-American people being at the protests or the Black Panthers or anything along those lines? And the Black Panthers were sort of the role models. They took a lot of their strategies from the Black Panthers. You know what? And this is what they taught us. And I've never told anybody this before, but it's because um, for every movement, you have to have extreme movements. You have to have the, and they told us this was the reasoning for the Brown Berets and the Black Panthers because you have to have the extreme for people to listen. Some people will not listen when you're having nonviolent uh, or not making enough noise. These people are making the noise and they're like the ones that do it just to bring attention to it. So it has to have a medium balance to come or meet in the middle, but it has, we have to have the extremists and we have to have the people that are nonviolent or the ones that are just the speakers or the, the quiet people or the, inst the, the politics. 
but I really believe in that to this day because of what they taught me. And, uh, and I knew a lot, of, I have, one of my friends today is still very active and a great writer that's a Black Panther. And he went to prison uh, for that. Oh, and I'm so sorry, I should have turned that off. I didn't know I had it on. Well, do you need to go? Let's see, no. what time is it? Yeah, pretty soon, yes. Do you have anything else you would like to say before you have to leave? Um, I just want more, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just happy that y'all recording this because, uh, like I said, we didn't record it. And I want to make note that uh, Weisenberger Street, to the two blocks of uh, uh, Mexicanos back then, uh, were as well known as Northside, Southside, Rock Island. And most of the families that lived on Weisenberger still, I mean, they've become uh, professionals. One of them was a professional boxer. One of them, uh, like my uncle, owned a barbershop in Southside. They all got into businesses. And my mother, who was one of my role models in her 70s, she painted the houses uh, on, in Linwood because they were all rental homes. And the slumlords would not do that. So she got the neighborhood police officer to go to the graffiti embankment paint, which is like a, the color of this. And uh, they painted all the little homes because they had pride. Those people had pride. This was their home, so they couldn't afford to paint their houses or get the paint. So we got to donate it. And my mother did this in her 70s. So the playground area is named after her and, uh, in our neighborhood. And the park is named after my father for all the work he did. And he was on the first Human Relations Commission. He helped start it here in Fort Worth. And so he did a lot of monumental stuff. And because of that, I think that's where I got my leadership from, because of their work. And that's all I want to give. I had a lot of great role models and strong women. Well, thank you for telling us our story. And oh, one more thing. My father, my father was given the, the uh, award of the spirit of Chavez, uh, Cesar Chavez, because uh, Julio Cesar Chavez, because he, uh, of his nonviolent ways, and his, how he got things done for the city of Fort Worth, and he was the first appointed Tarrant County Democratic chairman because of the fear either that the Mexicanos were organizing or something. So that he was appointed to that. And, and that was, and then Paso got others appointed and I mean elected. Anyway, so I, I come from volunteerism and uh, role models. So I just want more uh, the young to take risks and to give to their community. If we educate them, they will support their families and they will help the community. Well, thank you for telling us your stories. Thank you. Your story, and I hope we get to interview you a few more times. Oh, thank, thank you. you, thank you. I have so much to say. I can't, uh, you know, I, ha I lived in the best of times. It, depending.